This exercise, defining a review question, is a small group exercise. Participants are asked to explain to the trainer and other group members the PICO for their review. The trainer prompts the participants with questions to ensure that their PICO and eligibility criteria are clear and all issues have been considered. Well, if we're ready to go, all right, so what we're trying to do in this exercise is go through everyone's review topic in quite a bit of detail and really start to think about where those boundaries are for your eligibility criteria and maybe flag a couple of those things that you want to think about in part, as part of your subgroup analysis. So, um, yeah, we're really going to get into the nitty gritty and hopefully, um, from, by hearing about other people's topics, you'll get some ideas about your own. Um, but feel free to uh, speak up and ask questions if anything isn't clear. We're not all experts in the same area, and I am not a health professional of any kind, so <coughs> consider me your non-expert reader who will be asking all the silly questions. Um, also, possibly <coughs> misspelling your topic, but you know, feel free to point that out. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start with the population, then we'll go through the the comparison, the outcomes, and the study designs, and see how we go. So, I'm going to go clockwise. So we'll start with you, Um So what's your population for your review? Um, so just to let you know, mine is very preliminary. So That's okay. All, yeah. In that last session, like I was writing down things, and they're still all full of questions. Yeah. So That's the time to be thinking this stuff through, yeah, rather than six months down the track when you yes. suddenly realise you didn't spend enough time thinking it through. Yes. So yeah, now's the time. Um, so the population is um, pregnant women who are overweight. Okay. Um, the definition for that being BMI greater than th um, 25. But I don't know if that will need to be revised at some stage. Um, I've, in terms of um, subgroup analysis, mm -hmm. um, Pre-existing diabetes will have an intervention, and hopefully, I've not yet even started looking at studies, so I don't know how it's going to work. Um, in terms of hopefully, these will be before you know gestational diabetes and so forth. But um, I don't think you can. Um, I know there's Cochrane reviews already on dietary interventions for gestational diabetes. So that, okay. um, with that as an aside, it's that. not specifically that, but it will mm -hmm. be a subgroup analysis, I guess. Okay, all right, so you're thinking about different populations with and without diabetes within the review? Uh, yeah. Okay, so in terms of that eligibility criteria, pregnant's usually pretty uncontroversial to define. Um, the BMI of greater than 25, is that uh, a kind of a general clinically accepted um, measure for overweight? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So what's that? Normal is between 20 and 25. Yeah, okay. So and that's generally internationally used? Yes, internationally. Yeah, so internationally, yeah. yeah. They say anything greater than 25, which quite a huge part of the population is now. So yeah. yeah. But I think just for international purposes, that's yeah. an easy enough definition. Okay. And what happens if you come across a study that's looking at overweight women that has used a slightly different definition? Would you want to exclude that study? Um, Sometimes they talk in terms of percentiles, like more than 95th or 97th percentile, like in the the population. population, not in like adult, but it, they might yeah. use that cutoff as well. It's possible. Mm -hmm. More yeah. than 97th The percentile. unexpected might happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that's something that you can think about yeah. in terms of whether correct. you're happy for the <coughs> study authors to have their own definition of overweight, and yeah. then you know you may get some variation in that, or you may not. Mm -hmm. um, or whether you would think, well, look, for my question, I really am interested in women whose BMI is greater than 25, and if they've used another definition, that's going to Yeah, I think, I mean, we don't confuse the issue. I would just, um, kind of put that, because that was the first thing that came to mind, yeah. but I think the idea is just overweight, so it doesn't particularly matter how okay. they've defined it yeah. as such. All right, yeah, so this is one of those things where being a review author, you might... You might decide to let go a bit of your normal definitions yeah, and absolutely. open it up to whatever you might find out there, but you may not find any variation, or you might. Something to think about anyway. I've been looking at different studies and just noting down what the definitions are, if they have one at all, and following it up. 
Okay. And it can, like toileting assistance programs can include quite a few things. Yep. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's an example where the definitions of incontinence or incontinence incontinent enough to be mm. in the study is mm. going to vary from the study to study yes. so mm. that's something you'll as you say have to collect that information and work with in the review um, the age groups yeah we've in this kind of thing if there's no sort of particular clinical reason to go for 66 or 64 then 65 is as good a cutoff as any um, so have you considered what you'll do if you find a study that has uh, a population of 60 and greater, so most of the people are 65 plus, but a few of them might be a bit younger. Um, well, I haven't actually come across that yet. No, so right? <laughs> yeah, um, the vast majority do look at all the patients over 70 or 75, right, okay. so it hasn't been a problem yet. Great. But um, yeah, probably would um, contact my review group. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there's a couple of different, and I'm, I'm not sure if Sharon talked about this, I was out of the room briefly. Can anyone suggest what you might do in that? Yeah, so she, she says the three options, either you can include study leaving at 80% or mm -hmm. something, if it's closer, yeah. you can include, or then you can go into details and include the uh, population who's fitting your criteria. Right. So if you've only got separate yeah. data on only the 65 on the plus, then yeah, you could use that. Yeah, and third is just exclude the study. Yeah, so you've got those options and it's really a judgment call on your part to decide what the most appropriate response is. More often than not, they're all older. Okay. It's very hard to separate yeah. it up. Yeah. That's another, another thing that sometimes you can get from the authors is disaggregated or even individual patient data if they're cooperative and enthusiastic, which some of them are. Yeah. So if you were saying we'll include if it's got eighty percent or more, mm -hmm. do you have to have a good like is, is that an arbitrary number yes. or that's a totally arbitrary number? Yeah. yeah. So what it, essentially what you're trying to say is um, that most of them meet my criteria or at least half of them meet my criteria or whatever you choose the cutoff to be. Okay. Sometimes, um, although wherever possible we encourage you to stick to your protocol. Yeah. If you have said you'll exclude the studies and then you find a study that just has one patient that's wrong, you can change your mind and say, we had planned to exclude these studies, but we decided that because it was only one patient, that was sufficient to include. And you just have to be really transparent about that in the review. Make sure you state that you've made a change since the protocol and decided to include the study. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's about trying to make sure that you're getting all the data that's appropriate for your question. Mm -hmm. So you can change your mind if an unexpected scenario comes up. Yeah. But um, we do encourage you to stick to, to th try to think about this stuff as much as you can in advance and stick to it where possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In that case, let's start to think about the intervention. So coming back around, what's your intervention? A low saturated fat diet. Right. The exact definition of which I don't have at the moment. Okay, you may or may not need an exact definition. Mm -hmm. Depends. So again, this is an area where you might accept any study that said, that compares lower saturated fat to higher saturated fat comparator, whether that's standard diet or some other controlled thing that has a higher level of saturated fat in it. Or you might want to say, for my purposes, if it's not lower than this, it's not low enough to yeah. be what I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... Yeah, we've had quite a bit of discussion about it. Initially, um, it was kind of just dietary interventions, which I mm -hmm. think is probably a bit broad. Um, and then, you know, reduced versus low, so I mm -hmm. don't know, we need to look into it a little bit more. Yeah, that's an interesting difference, reduced versus low, so how low is low versus is it just lower than whatever they were doing before? Exactly, yeah. and I think ultimately it probably doesn't particularly matter how low it is, um, but yeah. Yeah, well, it's something to think about anyway, and then that, that then gives you an option in the review if you, if you go for low and give it a threshold, then that gives you a really clear answer about whether that below that threshold has an effect. Yeah. If you decide to go with lower, then it means within the review you can explore the different levels and compare them against each other perhaps, maybe, yeah. if you've got enough information. So yeah, and it's really about what question you're asking. Mm -hmm. So that's really something to, I'm sure you'll be able to sort out. Yeah.
Okay. Is there any issues about the duration of the diet that you're interested in, or you're happy to find the variation in that? Um, and that's, yeah, another thing that we're still in the discussion process, i.e. that, you know, what gestation does it have to have been started? Yep. Um, and, yeah, so, mm -hmm. I guess, sorry, I mean... No, 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 don't be sorry. Stage, this is, so it's, this um, kind of thinking is exactly, coming. yeah, where you need to be at. So it sounds like you're thinking about all the right stuff. Yeah, and then, um, you know, like subgroup analysis of whether it's going to be combined with exercise as well. Um, yeah. And... You know, then whether there's a dietitian involved, right. um, which I think in a lot of studies, um, you know, they may not um, have just separate things. So how that impacts as well. And yeah, as you said, the, du the duration for which it's mm -hmm. been going. Yeah. yeah. You might also get differences between studies that uh, actively control the diet, say providing all the food versus studies where they give the women advice to eat a particular way and you can't guarantee that they have actually done so. Yes. You might get that kind of variation as well. Perhaps you would know the literature better than me <laughs> in that area. Yeah. But as you say, the subgroup analysis is, is if you decide to include the variation within the review, then you can explore it within the review later on. It's yes. not that we're jumbling everything together and saying it's all the same. It's just about whether it's in or it's someone else's review. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Whether the outcome is a primary or a secondary, this is a really good issue to raise actually, whether the outcome is listed as primary or secondary in the included study. As a review author, we don't actually care. Yeah. As long as they did an intervention and that meets our criteria yeah. and they're looking at what they want to look at, then whether they ranked it as the most right. important thing they were looking at yeah. doesn't, doesn't, doesn't affect us. Yeah. We, we, we know what we're looking yeah. at. So the trick there will be, and I don't know that there's a way to solve this, it's just something you'll need to be careful of, is studies that measured sleep but didn't report it. Oh, yeah. Because um, what do we do with them? Well, how do you know what, when you found one? <laughs> um, oh, okay. So, and this is where that selective reporting can yeah. become a problem. So, if studies are measuring a whole raft of outcomes, they may be selective about which ones they put in the paper. Because the sleep may not have done well. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, you might need to do something like keep a really open mind when you're finding these studies. Yeah. And if you think it's a possibility that sleep was one of the things they might have measured, even if they didn't mention it, yeah. write to the authors and see if you can find out or have a look at the, if yeah. they're a registered study, you can look at the protocol yeah. um, in the trials register. Yeah. The cluing is again fatigue. Right. Um, that usually fatigue studies will use sleep and, and vice versa. Yeah. Or the lifestyle rehab ones increasingly will use sleep yeah. fatigue. So the common yeah. sort of psychosomatic symptoms in this population are now starting to be targeted as outcome measures. Right, yeah. So that kind of knowledge about what's commonly done in these studies, and you just need to be a bit suspicious, do a bit of sleuthing, yeah. and s try to make sure that you're not um, just finding the ones that have it. Okay, so it's somebody bigger than Ben Hur, that's what you're sort of saying. Well, to not necessarily. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, but you, you will need to kind of make sure that you try your best to find unpublished information for 